Thank you. It's an absolute delight to be here with you at this wonderful conference sponsored by Answers in Genesis. And it, you might be asking yourself, well, how does an Alzheimer's researcher get involved in Neanderthal uh, research? But I was watching the news, and as usually comes up every so often, the news reporter said, Science has shown humans and chimpanzees share 98% of their DNA. And I said, I don't believe that. I don't believe that, and I'm going to do some research in that area. And so we've been working on chimp and human DNA, similarities and differences, and we got off into Neanderthals because they did obtain some DNA sequences from Neanderthals. And so that's what we'll be focusing on today. Well, Neanderthals are commonly portrayed as being dumb, brute. I look up in the dictionary, and this is how it's described. And even in common use, if you call someone a Neanderthal, this is meant to be an insult. Well, here we have a cartoon, a far side cartoon, really highlighting the difference between modern humans who are making fun of the Neanderthals who can't make fire, can't throw a spear. Well, we know that this isn't true because we know that Neanderthals used fire and hunted and trapped prey. And what many people may not realize is the brain case of a Neanderthal is actually 200 cc's larger than ours. So who is the dumb brute? <laughs> the map here shows the general region where Neanderthal fossils have been found. Uh, the particular ones that I'll be mentioning are from the Felthofer cave and also uh, Mesmiskaya. There are distinct characteristics of the Neanderthal skull, which is shown most clearly in this comparison of a Cro-Magnon man and the La Chapelle au Saint skull. And what you notice particularly is the skull of the Neanderthal is flatter, is, it's wider, although we're looking from the side. The Neanderthal also has a occipital bun, a bulge at the back of the skull, a thick brow ridge. They also have a sloping forehead and a weak chin. And this comparison shows a Neanderthal skull on the left and a, what's called an early modern on the right. Now the interesting thing here is that they really do look quite a bit similar from this angle. Although you notice the skull has a, doesn't have as large a occipital bun. The brow ridge is a little smaller, and the skull is a little higher. Not a huge difference. And when the skull was first found, they thought that this descended from Neanderthals. And in particular, because it was first dated about 30,000 or 40,000 years, and so this fit in the time scale that this could be a, descent, a Neanderthal descendant. However, it was redated at 90,000 years old, which meant it really couldn't be descended from Neanderthals, which were later in the time history. So this really set in motion tr trying to figure out were Neanderthals closely related to humans or were they a distinct species. And this slide shows, uh, there, it was done by Milford Walpoff, who's at the University of Michigan, a very prominent uh, anthropologist. And he's in favor of what's called the multi-regional uh, view of man and evolution, which we'll talk about. But he pointed out that the early modern European skull in the middle is quite a bit more similar to the Neanderthal skull on the left, more so than a modern human skull, which is on the far right. The 
place of Neanderthal in human history has been very controversial, essentially from their first discovery. And it's interesting that the first Neanderthal was found 1856, in the same time period as we were hearing about uh, theologians who were compromising, starting to think about long periods of time, then Darwin's writing in 1859. So this discovery was at a key point in history. What did the Neanderthals do? They used fire, they made and used tools, including knives and scrapers. We have evidence that they hunted and trapped prey, and in particular that their diet was m consisted of a lot of meat. They, some have suggested they used jewelry and had jewelry, and there's been controversy over whether they have interbred with modern humans. There was one Neanderthal specimen that was found in Portugal it was a child, and they said it had characteristics of Neanderthal and modern human, and this was evidence that they interbred. This wasn't met with uh, complete agreement by uh, researchers who focus on Neanderthals. But we do have evidence that Neanderthals cared for each other because we see ones that had severe injuries that they would not have been able to survive if there were not people who were helping them and taking care of them and feeding them. We also know that Neanderthals buried their dead. There have been Neanderthals that have been found, a family that was buried, children and adults. In some cases, they're buried in a ritualistic fashion with the arms crossed. Some have been found with uh, remains of pollen, with jewelry, things that suggest that there was some type of ritual at the burial. And it's important to note, humans are really the only ones who bury their dead. This is also implying that the Neanderthals had some form of religion, at least believing in an afterlife. Well, these certainly are human traits, to be hunting, making tools, and caring for people, and burying their dead. Creationists contend that humans, all humans on the face of the earth, are descended from Adam and Eve. And we also put Neanderthals and Homo erectus as being descendants of Adam and Eve, even though the evolutionist dating puts these at 100,000 years and beyond. We see in scripture that Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. So if you wouldn't be able to trace your ancestry back to Adam and Eve, then it must mean that you're not a human. Now, many evolutionists consider Neanderthals to simply be a side branch, and this is because Neanderthals overlap skulls that are more archaic and more modern. So they don't fit in terms of an evolutionary progression very well, so they put them off to the side in a separate area. Neanderthals don't get very good press. Uh, this is uh, from CNN webpage, the first report about uh, mitochondrial DNA obtained from Neanderthals, which we'll be discussing. But look at the picture of the Neanderthal. A drawing, of course, but it looks very gorilla-like. This is National Geographic's version of Neanderthal, and when I saw this, it reminded me of the folks from the WWF. <laughs> and the uh, PBS, they had a program, Neanderthals on Trial, and this picture shows uh, two versions of Neanderthal. Uh, one, an older drawing, caveman, hair all over, carrying a club, I guess to hit his wife. And then the other, we see a Neanderthal boy and perhaps a father or grandfather. The boy looks much more human-like, and in some of the reconstructions I've seen, 
They look like children that are supposed to be in a movie like Quest for Fire or Planet of the Apes or something where they're made up to look like they're old. A normal human person made up to look like they're a caveman. Mark Davis, the producer of the PBS program, as he investigated and researched, talked to Neanderthal experts all over the world, he came to this conclusion. Each Neanderthal expert thought the last one I talked to was an idiot, if not an actual Neanderthal. <laughs> and this is because there's so much contention among the Neanderthal experts as to whether they were more human-like or less human-like, whether they interbred with modern humans, whether they were a side branch, whether they were a part of it. It really is a controversy. Among old earth creationists and progressive creationists, they tend to consider Neanderthals as a separate creation. And Hiras and Fazrana in particular have written about Neanderthals in this light. That they were, uh, and they call them bipedal primates, which is in some ways ironic because we are bipedal primates. We walk on two legs and we're members of the primate uh, order. So, but calling Neanderthals a bipedal primate makes them seem more ape-like and less human than they really are. They claim there's no direct link, and so if the Neanderthals and the Homo erectus were bipedal primates that existed before God made Adam special. They typically accept evolutionist dating. And I read a paper. The title of this paper is Toward a More Accurate Time Scale for the Human Mitochondrial DNA Tree. So they're trying to get a more accurate date for when all modern humans steered a common ancestor. And the more accurate date that they came up with was 89,000 plus or minus 69,000. <laughs> now, what that was more accurate than, I'm not really sure. But it doesn't bode well for accuracy. Uh, the chart here shows uh, human ancestors, according to evolution dates, uh, and you know, they talk about the missing link and the search for the missing link, and it seems like every time they have found a new uh, candidate for human ancestry, they've created a new missing link, because in this chart, there's a question mark that's in the link for every specimen on the chart. And why does it matter? Why does it matter if Neanderthal shared a gene pool with modern humans or not. Well, if they did, then this would support a creationist model. See, if the Neanderthal is part of the human gene pool, then this argues against the separate creation. It argues against them being created before Adam. I also wondered when they're if Adam, if God brought to Adam all of the animals and he couldn't find one that was a suitable partner for him, if God had brought a Neanderthal woman, it would seem like this would have been a suitable partner for him. So they've got that problem. But if Neanderthals are part of the human gene pool, then it suggests these skeletal differences of the skull are really quite minor. And in fact, I, I believe they are. Now, while we don't, um, these aren't common traits that are seen, I was in the grocery store with my wife, and I saw a man who I wish I could get an x-ray of his skull because <laughs> I really thought he would look like a Neanderthal. And as we're walking down the aisles, uh, occipital bun, check. Brow ridge, check. And there is a staff member at Liberty, 
There's a staff member at Liberty who also, I think he has a Neanderthal skull morphology. And when I mentioned this in the apologetics class that I teach, I thought, now don't go trying to find this person. <laughs> It's not common. And in fact, I had a student a few years ago, I think she had Homo erectus type skull features. And she made an A in my cell biology class. But you know, as we would look around the room, we would see differences in skull shape. A lot of similarities and overlap, but we would see people in different shapes of skull. Also, if Neanderthals are part of the human gene pool, then the long ages could be called into question. And in particular, if they're able to obtain DNA from a fossil sample that is meant to be 30,000 years old, this is a long time for DNA to remain intact, enough for them to clone us and sequence it. Also, if Neanderthals are part of the human gene pool, then this would suggest that they are descendants of Adam and Eve, just as we are. This slide shows evolutionary models that have been used to suggest how humans evolved. It contrasts the out of Africa model, which contends that anatomically modern humans arose in Africa somewhere around 100, 150,000 years ago. And these spread out and replaced more archaic humans that were there, the Neanderthals and Homo erectus. Uh, and so this is a replacement model out of Africa. It contrasts with regional continuity or multi-regional model, which suggests that the modern humans coming out of Africa interbred with all of the other types of uh, humans, Homo erectus, Neanderthals that were around. And it's interesting to me as I study this because there will be a paper that says we proved the out of Africa model and just wait a little while and next you'll see one that refutes that paper, that the out of Africa model isn't correct, then there's one out of Africa is correct. And right now we're on a out of Africa is correct because just a couple of weeks ago a study was published that uh, they looked at Cro-Magnon DNA and this matched uh, modern humans closer than Neanderthal and so this puts Neanderthal out again. Well, this has been a great controversy, and just studying the fossils hasn't led to any conclusion as to the place of Neanderthals. And so in 1997, there was an important paper in the journal Cell in which the researchers had obtained mitochondrial DNA from a fossil Neanderthal. And not just any Neanderthal, it was from the Feltofer cave, the type specimen of Neanderthals. And the cover of Cell said in the conclusion of the study, Neanderthals were not our ancestors. So the scientists have uh, resorted to this DNA evidence because the fossils were so ambiguous. And so they hoped that the DNA sequences would lay this to rest once and for all. Mitochondrial DNA is what they looked at, and this mitochondrial DNA is coming from a particular organelle within the cell. It's called the powerhouse of the cell because the mitochondria actually is the main site of energy production in cells. And the mitochondria has its own unique DNA strand. It's a circular strand as opposed to the chromosomes which are found in the nucleus, the DNA in the nucleus. And mitochondrial DNA is primarily inherited maternally. So you should have the mitochondria DNA that your mother has, even though in your 
nucleus of your cell, you have chromosomes that has a set of genes from your father and a set of genes from your mother. Mitochondrial DNA almost always comes just from the mother. There's just a few reports now that have called the maternal inheritance into question, and it's not completely settled yet. This is a diagram that shows the outline of the human mitochondrial DNA, and it's very economical. And what I mean by that is virtually all of the DNA that's part of this chromosome codes for proteins or codes for tRNA and ribosomal RNA that are required to assemble proteins. So there's not much extra DNA that's present here. There's only about a thousand base pairs that don't code for protein or the tRNAs, and this is part of the origin of replication. We need that origin of replication to allow the two strands of DNA to separate, and that's the site where uh, DNA polymerase enzyme is going to start um, replicating the DNA. In this origin of replication site, there are two regions of particular importance. They're called hypervariable regions one and two. And the reason they're called hypervariable is because these sites are the most different among different people and also among different types of organisms. So that's the main place where they're going to look to make uh, phylogenetic trees to infer ancestry. This is a picture from that paper and cell where they took the, cut the bone, and this was a major deal to be destroying, in essence, part of the fossil material, which is irreplaceable. But in order to get the DNA sequence, it was necessary. And so they cut part of the bone and obtained mitochondrial DNA in this way. And they looked specifically at hypervariable region 1, and then in a subsequent paper looked at hypervariable region 2. But it was quite a spectacular feat to be able to obtain DNA from a fossil specimen like this. There's also a report where they believe they had DNA from Triceratops, a dinosaur. But the funny thing was, it turned out it's 100% identical to turkeys. <laughs> and so at first they were really excited because they thought they had proof now that <laughs> birds evolved from dinosaurs. But there were a couple of problems with this. One, birds aren't supposed to have evolved from the same line that Triceratops is. And they believe probably it was contamination in a turkey sandwich. <laughs> and part of the problem, part of the problem is because Turkeys are about 90-some percent, 95%, I think, similar to any other bird. So if it were true, then turkeys would be more similar to Triceratops than they are to any other bird. <laughs> but whether they were able to exactly get DNA from the Neanderthal, they, in terms of controls, they did the best job that they could. And so I assume that the sequence that they're obtaining is fairly accurate, although it's possible that the DNA base pairs uh, had chemical changes that would induce mutations. That's a possibility, but we have to accept their sequence as being reflective of the Neanderthal in the best way. So they published their first paper in Cell, and then later in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And they reported a large number of differences compared to modern humans, and in particular to the modern human reference sequence. They also said this proves the out-of-Africa hypothesis because we see that Europeans, which is where Neanderthals were primarily found in Europe, Europeans are not more similar 
to Neanderthals than any other region. People in Asia and Africa were just about as distant as the people in Europe. So they said this must mean that they were replaced. They also estimated a common ancestor between Neanderthals and modern humans at 465,000 years ago. It's important to point out that the way they obtained this date was to compare humans to chimps to get a mutation rate. So they get the number of mutations between a human and a chimp. And since humans and chimps shared a common ancestor four million years ago, you can take that number of differences, divide by four million years, and you get a rate. Then you multiply the rate times the number of differences in Neanderthal and modern humans, and that gives you the age for the common ancestor for Neanderthals and humans, based on evolutionary assumptions. As they did their sequence comparisons, they found they did hypervariable region 1 and also hypervariable region 2. On hypervariable region 1, they found 27 differences out of 379. In hypervariable region 1, there were 11 out of 340. And so they, they com combined these to get an estimated age. And there was a, an additional group that did a study from Mesmoskaya, and they reported 22 out of 345 uh, bases that were different. So they had a large number and compared to modern humans. In this chart from the original paper, they compared modern humans to each other, and so they get the human-human difference. They compare modern humans to the Neanderthal and get that curve that's in the middle, and they compare humans to chimps and get the one to the far right. And since the human-Neanderthal differences were outside of the average for human-human differences, they said this shows that they're outside, they are not part of the human gene pool. There was a small amount of overlap where the two come together. There was a small, so there are a few modern humans that had more differences to other modern humans than, they, than modern humans did to Neanderthals. This was such a small percentage, they said, it pretty much rules it out. Well, that was one that we were particularly interested in for research, which we'll show in a later slide. There's some objections that can be raised against uh, their study. And first, the human reference sequence. When I first was looking at this, I thought it was some kind of consensus sequence or something like that, but it's not. The human reference sequence is just the first human mitochondrial DNA that was sequenced. Around 1980 is when this was reported. And it's not fair, it's not fair to compare Neanderthals that are old with modern humans, comparing modern humans to modern humans. And the reason is, any modern human on the planet is likely to share a more recent common ancestor with any other modern human on the planet than either of them will with the Neanderthal. Also, as they looked at different Neanderthal specimens, the variation among the Neanderthals is about the same as the variation that's among modern humans. In, this, in the study that they did in cell, they compared a large population of modern humans against one Neanderthal, and that's hardly fair. There's one other issue, and that is the mutation rate. If the mutation rate is rapid, then that will be a major factor, especially as we compare modern humans today with a Neanderthal that is obviously old. And as a creationist, I did not believe that Neanderthals should be separate, since I believe Neanderthals were descendants of Adam and Eve. And so we wanted to investigate this further. 
we did our own study looking at uh, DNA sequences we obtained from GeneBank database and compared that against Neanderthal sequences. But we tried to do it in a more fair way. And so we compared modern humans, about 180, 190, we compared them against the reference sequence to see how many differences modern humans had against the reference sequence and then how many differences modern humans had against the Neanderthal sequence, one Neanderthal sequence. And then did the same thing with, tw with chimpanzees. And we obtained a similar curve to what they had in the paper, which was that there was a clear shift between the pool comparing to Neanderthals and the pool comparing to modern humans. But because I refused to accept that, I didn't believe it, and so I investigated it further. And I remember that they had a little bit of overlap between modern humans with large numbers of differences in the Neanderthal. And so that's where we focused our research. So we looked at individual modern humans that had the largest number of differences to the reference sequence. And what we found was a lot of these have matches to Neanderthals. So where a modern human differs from the reference sequence, at that particular site, they have exactly the same nucleotide as the Neanderthal. And these were for the individuals that had the most difference to the human reference. And I called up and talked to an evolutionary anthropologist and mentioned this result to them to try to get some feedback. And they asked, well, what about all the other modern humans? Are those that are most different from the reference sequence that have matches to Neanderthal, do they have more matches to Neanderthals than those with fewer differences to the reference? And so we did that study, and at first I was disappointed because what I found was modern humans all across the board where they differ from the reference sequence, they tend to match the Neanderthal. And at first this was, this was a puzzle, but it really makes sense. It really makes sense that we would match Neanderthal where we're different from the reference sequence. In the study of the Mesmiskaya Neanderthal, reported in Nature, they gave this chart and they had the human reference sequences across the top, and then on the bottom is the Feldhofer, the first Neanderthal that was reported, and then above that is Mesmiskaya. And what I noticed in this report is every place where the two Neanderthals differ, every single place where the two Neanderthals differ, one of them matches the human reference sequence. This suggests a much closer relationship. Then it, we also had read some stuff about mutational hotspots. There are particular sites in mitochondrial DNA that tend to mutate at a faster rate. And so we looked at how are the hotspots affected. And when we did the study counting, the same study, modern humans against the reference sequence, modern humans against the Neanderthal, looking at the hotspots, we found much more overlap. It's still statistically significantly different, but there's much more overlap counting the hotspot sites than it is counting all of the sites. See, mutational hotspots are noted for particular uh, nucleotide sites in the mitochondrial DNA. This was a study that looked at this. And so what they do is they take the proportion of individuals who have an A instead of a G at a particular site and a T instead of a C and so forth and see there may be 20% of people who have an A and 80% have a G. And so they find these particular sites that have a high 
uh, mutation frequency. And I have marked here sites where Neanderthals differ from the reference sequence are primarily at these hotspot mutation sites. We, we did a similar analysis and I have several, gra several charts here that show the same thing. The red are sites where Neanderthals differ from the reference sequence and the height of the bar shows what proportion of modern humans have differences at that site. And the arrow, red arrow, shows where a Neanderthal differs, but there's not modern humans that differ at that same site. And across the bottom show all the different sites where, in our study, modern humans had differences. And what is clear is that the majority of these sites where Neanderthals differ from the human reference sequence, the majority of these are sites where there are many modern humans that differ at those sites and have the same matching base that the Neanderthal has. And so uh, Neanderthals have, uh, if you add, get the total, Neanderthals have 19 differences that are common among the three Neanderthal specimens that they have. 19 differences in common, 12 of those are at hot spots. HVR2, 7 out of 10 of those shared differences are at hot spots, meaning these are exactly the same nucleotide sites that modern humans have a high degree of difference. When we compare the Neanderthal specimens to each other, where they differ is not primarily at the hot spots. Only 2 out of 12 were hot spots. And then when we look at chimps, 21 chimps, only 12 of the 54 differences that there are between humans and chimps are at the hot spots. So clearly there is a close relationship between Neanderthals and modern humans since we're varying at exactly the same hot spot sites and chimps are varying at all different sites. We did a site by site analysis and this shows the percentage of individuals from different parts of the world and where they match the Neanderthal. So at the, an average of 68% of the sites where modern humans differ from the reference sequence, they match the Neanderthal. Same for HVR1 and with chimpanzees. Chimpanzees have a much lower percentage of match and we'd expect about 20%, 20-25% uh, match just from random chance. There have been other researchers that have questioned the Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA studies and in particular that they proved the out of Africa hypothesis. Two papers published said this uh, really doesn't prove out of Africa. In one case they suggest that DNA damage was likely occurring over time and this would induce mutations, this would create differences and so it's possible that this is responsible for some of those differences. Also as they estimate the divergence dates they need to account for different differences in mutation rate. Many of the sites in mitochondrial DNA are invariant while others there's a large amount of variation and so this leads to a, an erroneous figure for an age. Also they noted that the human mitochondrial database has population bias and what that means is certain people groups are more heavily represented than others. Uh, Korea, there's a large number of Koreans in the database, large number of Europeans in the database, and they know Europeans have a high degree of similarity in the DNA as opposed to Africa which has a large amount of diversity and yet African populations are really underrepresented in the database. So what this does is it skews 
the data so that modern humans, if you do a comparison, have more similarity than they really do because, because of which populations you're selecting. In a paper that was published just last year, they called these uh, Neanderthal DNA studies into question as far as proving that they were outside of the human gene pool. And they said the separate phylogenetic position of Neanderthals is not supported when these other factors are considered. They did a more detailed, uh, more sophisticated analysis in this paper. And they showed that Neanderthal human and human-human pairwise distance distributions overlap more than what previous studies have suggested, and therefore the multi-regional, the interbreeding, cannot be ruled out. In other words, we can't exclude Neanderthals from the human gene pool. But what about the ages? Neanderthals and modern humans clearly have a shared gene pool, but what about the ages since Neanderthals are supposed to be 30,000, 60,000 years old? It was a paper which I was amazed at. Instead of doing comparisons like they've always done, comparing to chimp and then inferring an age based on the chimp, this group actually looked at mutation events. They took mothers and grandmothers and their children and compared their mitochondrial DNA to see what the true mutation rate was, generational mutation rate. And the rate that they got was order of magnitude faster than previous ones based on estimates comparing to CHIMP. And so in the discussion of their paper, Using our empirical rate, this measured generational mutation rate, they get a most recent common ancestor for all modern humans 6,500 years ago. A biblical time scale. Now, let's get a little bit of an error here. 6,500 years. But this is clearly incompatible with the known age of modern humans. They spent a large portion explaining how there can be other explanations for this rapid rate. There have been other papers that have tried to come up with an alternative to this, but right here they have empirical data supporting a biblical time scale, but clearly that's incorrect because of how old we know modern humans are. Now, if Neanderthals overlap modern humans in their mitochondrial DNA, and empirical mutation rates show a common ancestor for all modern humans 6,500 years ago, then this would mean the common ancestor of humans and Neanderthals should have been less than 6,500 years ago. Some other points. It's estimated that all Europeans, had, native Europeans, have about 7 to 10 different haplotypes of DNA. So a majority of people in England have exactly the same mutation site, mutation at uh, site 73 in the mitochondrial DNA. Also, it was reported that they obtained specimen from China, 2,500-year-old Chinese. This is from northeast China their mitochondrial DNA matches European types, which is quite surprising from an out-of-Africa model. Also, in India, they have a deep European root, and what that means is there are 20% of natives in India have a European type of DNA. And this is the type from Iceland and Finland. The Chinese, ancient Chinese, have the same DNA that they have in Finland and Iceland. This is very strange from an out-of-Africa perspective. Also, they found Kennewick Man. Kennewick Man was found in uh, northwest United States. And... It's uh, been a controversy because it's claimed that this is an 
ancient Indian, uh, and the Indians, Native Americans, were concerned because they were disturbing the uh, burial grounds and so forth to be analyzing this um, specimen. Then, Mungo Man in Australia is older than Neanderthal. It's anatomically modern, but it has mitochondrial DNA that's not as divergent as the Neanderthal. So this is a puzzle, but it fits within a Tower of Babel, migration after Tower of Babel model. So if you have groups of individuals moving out from the Tower of Babel, some of those are going to have uh, uh, ha uh, mitochondrial DNA in common, others will be different. And so people with European type DNA had moved to China, had moved to India, had moved across into the, what's now the United States. And people with a Neanderthal type had moved across into Europe. And this paper was just published, it's in May 22nd, Nature. So this is hot off the press, May 22nd. But they looked at mice, mitochondrial DNA from, or mitochondria from mice, and they looked at museum specimen mice, and what they found was that they were completely different. The genotype that was most common 100 years ago is now extremely rare, indicating that mammalian mitochondrial gen genome can undergo rapid evolution. Now, as they've described the out of Africa model, what they have is anatomically modern man comes in and replaces Neanderthals because they're smarter or have language or something like this. And this is supposed to take thousands of years. Well, just in Chicago, in 100 years, they had a complete replacement of mitochondrial DNA types in mice. This suggests that these types of things can happen very rapidly. And so it is further support for Neanderthals being part of the human gene pool. The implications are that the divergence time that evolutionists have reported for Neanderthals and modern humans sharing a common ancestor has been seriously misplaced. It should be put within the biblical time scale. And clearly Neanderthals cannot be excluded from human history because they aren't humans just like us.